Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Almost every day, I talk to somebody who's either dealing with panic attacks, anxiety, worry, concern, fear, they're stressed out, they're wigging out. And I don't know if you've ever met anybody who's wigged out on you. They don't make sense. They just rattle. Now, I'm sure if you work in a workplace that's high stress, you get that from people that, um, you know, how's your day? Don't ask that question. <laughs> Sometimes they're afraid of what people think of them or that their boss is going to fire them. They're going to lose their job. They're going to get laid off. They're a failure. Nobody likes me. My parents hate me. They're afraid of commitment. Not all at one time. I'm just listing different things that people struggle with. Not having enough money to pay the bills is probably right up at the top of that fear. Um, traveling. How many of you guys ever flew on a plane and you hate flying? That's oh, y'all like it, huh? I like to fly. Fear of flying is a really big deal with some people. A fear of traveling. I know people that can't even travel in the car. They have to cover their head as they're being driven places because they hate going down the expressway and seeing semis next to them. Mm -hmm. Flying on an airplane is right at the top. Failure, fear of failure or rejection, spiders and snakes are right in that category of fear. Um, losing a loved one, fear that somebody really close to them is gonna die. Or that something's going to happen to their kids. Or that they're going to catch a disease. Um, or that they're going to experience pain or death. Those are all at the top of the list of fear. Some people are afraid when it comes time to take a test. Um, especially if they don't study. <laughs> but um, swimming. Some, I've known people are, are very afraid of the water, um, afraid of dogs. I don't know anybody afraid of a cat. <laughs> but afraid of a dog, yes. I've had plenty of people that have said that. Um, insects, little bugs. I mean, it could be literally one of those little beetle bugs that turn orange or are orange and have little spots on them. The ladybugs. The ladybugs. And then once in a while you see those little stink bugs that will be flying around. Everybody is doing this. You can see them kind of wincing as it flies through, you know. People are afraid of heights. I'm not so much afraid of heights, I just tip over. So when I stand on a ladder, it's um, my vision makes it feel like I'm going forward and I follow the way my vision goes, and I fall over off the ladders. So they don't let me on them anymore. Right. Smart move. If I'm looking straight up in the air, I can do it. Confined space. Being in a confined space or an elevator, there's people that are afraid of that. Or what the future holds. I had somebody that are really worried that Jesus is going to come back before they have children. <laughs> and get married. And the list is long for people that deal with fear. Whatever the fear may be, it's important to know it does not come from God. God is not a giver of fear. Oh, by the way, I have a package for you I'd like to give you. Fear. Would you like to open it? <laughs> you will never see God saying, I have a package for you. Yeah. Gift of fear. Right. You know, it kind of goes with those same gifts of torment and mental insanity and all those things that people say. God is not a giver of fear. That's right. So, um, 
In fact, one of the most, the primary reasons, and let me put it this way, the number one tool, I would say, that the enemy uses against people to stop them from doing anything for God is fear. If he can paralyze you and get you to go, uh, I can't do this, he will. If he knows he doesn't have a leg to stand on, he'll stop trying and he'll try something else. It used to be that public speaking was the number one fear in America. That you're going to have somebody put a microphone in your face and say, Speak. Oh, arf. <laughs> now it is living a life that doesn't make any difference to anybody. I don't matter. I'm afraid I don't matter to anybody. Whatever I do does not matter. That is the number one complaint for fear. Now, I know I put on Facebook that there were 365 do not, fear nots. I'm wrong. I went in to do my study to find out there's really only 80. Somebody made that up. They took every little, little thing where the Lord said, trust in me, and they added that all together as a fear not. I'm like, really? I really like that little post. I thought that little 365, one for every day of the year, sounded really cool. And that's right. Psalms 56, 3 and 4. When I am afraid of, I leave it blank. I will trust in you, O Lord. Amen. Psalms 56, 3 and 4. I'm waiting for Nick to pull it up. Psalms 56, 3 and 4. Now, I want you just to change the word on it. When I am afraid of spiders, I will trust in you, Lord. When I am afraid of flying, when I am afraid, so think of it having a little blank spot after that. I will have confidence in and put my trust and reliance on you. Life is a journey. It is 365 days a year. Two, excuse me, 24-7 hours a day, 24 hours, seven days a week. With Yahweh, your Lord, Adonai, your God, Elohim, your Creator. And if he ain't got this covered, there is nobody going to have it covered for you. When I'm afraid, and my husband hasn't come home from work yet, he was due an hour ago. Lord, I will put my trust in you and diligently hold on to trusting you in prayer that you have him covered and protected. Fear is a very strong emotional reaction. Perceived, something you perceive that there's imminent danger to. It's characterized by something called fight or flight. You either stand and fight in the middle of it or you run like a chicken with its head cut off. I should not use that terminology. But I'll tell you what, if you've ever seen a chicken run, <laughs> you will either run in the middle of fear or you will freeze. So you either, it's flight, fight, or freeze. You will either panic <gasps> or you will stand and fight or you will run. That's the response. 
Now, I don't know um, if any of you have ever experienced paralyzing fear. Paralyzing fear, you can't move. I've had a few people that have been paralyzed with fear in their sleep. And they called me. And they said, I, 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 I couldn't move. And I had to walk them through it, tell them what to do. They haven't had an episode since. They just told me that the other day. I had another girl. Fear attacked her every night. She burned. Oh, excuse me. She died in a fire every night in her sleep. And she called me, and I gave her a prayer to pray. I phone up for her, sent it to her. She said she slept for the first night. No fear. And she said, I didn't die that night. I didn't die. Yeah, it's kind of strange when someone calls you on the phone to tell you they didn't die. Right? Yeah. Also had another young woman who took an overdose of cocaine. And I mean a massive overdose. And it burned out the sensors in her brain. And when she slept every night, she died a different way. And so I got her given to me in foster care. And they had her on medication. But she didn't know what to do about it. She didn't like the nightmares every night. Isn't it interesting how the enemy comes in? The minute he has an open window or a little avenue, he flips open that door, he runs right in there, and he wreaks havoc with your mind. Now, she could wake up and know she wasn't dying, but boy, when she went to sleep, she didn't want to go to sleep every night. I had to fight with her to go to bed. I'd say, go to bed. I don't want to. Go to bed. You don't understand. Go to bed. Daniil, I can't. If I go to sleep, the minute I go to sleep, somewhere in my sleep, I'm going to get attacked. Once she learned how to combat that, I just saw her the other, a little bit ago. I was going to say the other day, but it's really been about a year. And did you know what? She's recovered. Amen. But it was a journey. People that are really attacked by fear, not fear of a ladybug. <laughs> Which, there are some people I've seen spaz at ladybugs, or even the tiniest spider. Yeah. They just go like, ah! I'm like, really? <laughs> yeah. Slap. You know. Yeah. Who's bigger? That's right. Yeah. <laughs> fear is not a gift from God. We've covered that. For God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and of a sound mind. It means he gave you a sound mind. So don't even pull the I'm going crazy card on your pants. Don't even pull the I can't help it, Bob. I can't help it. God has not given you a spirit of fear, but he's given you power, love, and of a sound mind. Get control of your mind. Yes. So I've had people tell me, but I'm ADHD. I can't help it. Yes, you can. Because he says he gave you a sound yes. mind. Amen. Now operate in it. Amen. And did you know what happens? You call them on that when you see somebody having a meltdown. Yep. Call them on it and they'll, they'll, they'll get a grip. Yeah. And they'll come into alignment. Oh, okay. I have a sound mind. Now we're going to process this and talk about it. And then they'll be able to do it. Fear actually will weaken your immune system. It will cause heart damage. It can cause a heart attack. The Bible says that their hearts failed them for fear of what was coming on the earth. That means they had a heart attack because of fear. Yeah. Fear causes stress. It also causes ulcers. Irritable, irritable bowel syndrome. Decreased fertility. People that live in fear, 
are less likely to have children. It accelerates your aging. You get your wrinkles earlier. And you get older quicker. <laughs> yes! Oh. It causes <laughs> premature death. It, actually, they have that down there, premature death. Yeah. It impairs your memory so you don't think clearly because fear has paralyzed certain parts of your memory. Fear can impair long-term memory. Yes. It can cause damage to certain parts of your brain, and they can see it on the MRIs. It's difficult to regulate fear. A person that's anxious most of the time has chronic fear. Their memories confirm that. They don't remember very well. And they usually will suffer from something called PTSD, yes. post-traumatic stress syndrome. They can live in fear. I remember when one of my sons came back from war, the first 4th of July. Bam, bam, bang, 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 bang. And he said, I can't take this. i got to get out of here. Now, you just watch a dog during the fireworks. It was a bad idea, bad idea. Do not take puppy to the fireworks. So the dog was kind of tiny and his name was Timber. And sure enough, we took him down to the East Jordan Ironworks parking lot for the fireworks. And um, he was just gonna go in the car. Not a big deal. And first he was out and when the fireworks started, he took off running, and I don't know if he ran a mile or two. Running, my son was in back of him chasing him, this little tiny dog. As fast as Raman could run, that dog was running faster. Finally, he gets a hold of him. He carries him all the way back, puts him in the car. But as the explosions are going off and all the fireworks, he pees and poos that entire car. No. He was so fear gripped him like you wouldn't believe. It can have that same effect on somebody who has been in war. Yes. Yeah. So sometimes something can trigger fear and cause in you a reaction that maybe you don't even know why you're reacting like you're reacting. Fear can be um, it can interrupt you from being able to regulate your emotions. You won't be able to get nonverbal cues from somebody. Somebody's going like, shh, shh, don't say that. No, no, calm down, calm down, calm down. Doesn't matter how many times you say calm down. They are not calming down. They are going to do what they're going to do until the episode is done. They react without thinking. They don't have any ethics or any, any um, control over their tongue sometimes when they operate with fear. Yes. Some people will start swearing mm -hmm. when they're afraid. And it impacts your thinking and decision-making ability. That's why they tell you in the middle of stressful situations, stay calm. Nick's the only one that does that. He's the only one that stays calm. Everybody else goes like, whoo! You know, Glenn does too. He can go to a big fire. That's why they're the chiefs. You know, they can handle high stress and stay calm. But it also causes mental fatigue. Chronic depression. And mental health issues. Fear is not a gift from God. That's right. That's right. It is actually not from him at all. Everything that God has made and created that's good, the enemy, the devil, Satan, has taken and twisted it. I can't believe that people say, oh, I love, I just love those movies that are just like, oh, horror movies uh, have no idea what they're putting into them. I'm going to tell you, 
<laughs> if you're ever put in a situation, and I can say this because it's teenagers and not little kids, but I watched a commercial from Psycho years ago. It took me years to be able to take a shower without seeing a knife coming through the shower curtain. All it was was a commercial. What you put in you will come out somewhere down the line, and you ain't going to enjoy it. We have a rule at our house. No torment, no rape, no swearing, none. Okay? No fear, no horror mm -hmm. in my house. So why do you think I would allow it on this? Right. Or go to a movie and watch it? Right. I say, absolutely not. And because of that, people say, how do you sleep so calmly all night? <laughs> I mean, you guys can hit the bed and you're just sleeping. Perfect love casts out all fear. I don't have any. I didn't entertain it. I didn't feed it. If you feed fear long enough, like the young woman that said, <clears throat> I asked her if she wanted deliverance because she said she has a split personality and they were going to put her in a mental institution because she could, she sees the other part of her. What do you think she's seeing? She's seeing a demonic spirit. That's right. Okay. She says, it's the other part of my personality and do I have to get rid of that? Oh, if I cast it out, it'll leave. Well, will it change my personality? I'm like, what do you mean? She goes, well, I like murder. Uh, and I like watching gore. No. I don't want to stop that. I said, well, if Jesus comes in and he saves you and he delivers you, you'll stop that. Yes. If he really comes in and delivers you and saves you. But if you want to feed yourself fear, you're feeding yourself actual fuel from the devil. Yes. That's right. And it will open a door in your life. Amen. You don't think it will open? Oh, you better believe it's going to open a door for sickness and disease and a whole bunch of other things, mental depression, all of those things to come in if you feed yourself fear. Yes, right. If you're a believer in Christ, faith is opposite of fear. Perfect love casts out all fear. You want the things of God, and you want the good things, you want the gifts of the Spirit operating in your life, you want to lay hands on the sick and see them recover, you don't give the devil one inch. Not one inch. Fear is an obstacle. I love this one. First of all, Hebrews 13, 5, you don't have to put it up, says, For God has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Forsake you. I can guarantee you he's going to be with you. Amen. So you can say with confidence, okay, God, you're with me, and I'm going to the hospital with my nephew, and he has a broken arm. You're riding in the car right beside me. I'm not going to be afraid because you're in the car yes. with me. You're going to start to rely on God a little more than relying on you. Yes. God wants you to know he's going to take care of you as long as you place your trust in him. Amen. God is your best teacher. He doesn't smack you upside the head to make sure that you got it right. Did you hear me? Girl, girl, you got it? If you didn't, I'm going to bang. You got it? Give me your knuckles. You get the little ruler out and God does this. Bam! I told you to get it right the first time. No way. Actually, God is the one that comes in and kneels down beside your desk. Mm -hmm. Where you're taking the test of life. And he says, you got this one. I'm right beside you. You can do this. Oh, remember that scripture I taught you? I spoke it to you. Yeah. You got this, honey. My presence is with you. I've anointed you for this moment. Just walk in assurance. That's right. You're, you're in the middle of a test or you're in the middle of a trial. I haven't abandoned you. I'm just sitting right beside you in the chair. We can do this together. You start to see the teacher 
The Holy Spirit is on course with you. I love that. See, that's just what happens when you sit in the front row and you get picked up. It's usually jazzed up. She sits right here and we're like <laughs> messing with her, you know. So God is your teacher. The Holy Spirit is your teacher. You do not have to fear. So when the Lord tells you to fear not, he's not saying you're never going to feel fear. Okay, he gave you emotions. You may feel fear. It's what you do with it when you feel it. Okay, I've had to deal with fear a couple times recently. You know what I do? I go to my medicine and I look it up and I begin to quote it and I begin to read it and I begin to meditate it and I've been taking it in the morning and taking it at the noon and taking it at nighttime. And so I look at it like this. The word of God is like health and healing to all your flesh. Amen. It is better than amoxicillin. Yes. By far better than Motrin. Any narcotic. By far better than any allergy medication is this. I have learned. Take it morning, noon, and night. Daniel prayed three times a day. Amen. I remember, I know people that didn't go 15, 20 minutes without reading something in the scriptures. I don't have time every 15 minutes to pull out a Bible and read. But I do have time in the morning. I have time in the afternoon. I have time in the evening to look at God's word. God is not telling you you'll never feel fear. He's telling you you're not going to let fear control you or make decisions for you or operate in you or prevent you from moving forward. They will tell you true courage is moving forward in the face of fear. Well, I don't know if that's true or not. Could someone please move the children from that table and put them at a different table? When you feel fear, you're going to have to make a choice. <coughs> so, when the enemy tells you this, did you know you're going to die? I wouldn't drive during this storm, even though you have to, because you're going to get in an accident. But you know it's not God. No, God, I, I have to go to work. I'm going to trust you, and I'm going to put the angels of God around my vehicle. You begin to quote the word when you really are faced with fear. A child gets sick, and suddenly their fever don't come down, and you've prayed for them, and you're not seeing an instant result. And the enemy says, huh, they're really sick. I bet you they got, like, spinal meningitis. They all, mind you, the enemy only knows how to lie. So he invents something. He doesn't even invent truth. He just invents a lie. You know, you're going to lose your job. You saw your supervisor, how she looked at you. You know, you're the one that's going. When they clear out and get rid of some of the people, you're next in line. All it takes is one thought. And if you nurture that and you feed that and you don't go after it with medicine... Oh, no. My God shall supply all my need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And I will not fear. Amen. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. You begin quoting the word, and it is just like medicine. I love it. I love it. So you have a choice when you're afraid. I like this story in Numbers chapter 13. So I'm going to tell you a story. You can read it later. Moses says, I've given you the land, and uh, we're going to go over and take the land, and I'm going to call forth one spy from every tribe. I need 
one spy from the tribe of Judah, the tribe of Reuben, Reuben the tribe of Levi. I need a spy from over here from the tribe of Gad and Manasseh. Now he didn't pick a normal CSI spy. It says he picked a leader. Right. Now that means somebody that had a half a brain. Somebody smart and intelligent. Somebody that had some skill. And he said, you're it. And you're it. What a privilege to get picked as a spy. I always thought CSI work was fun. would be fun. You know, go in with my little brush, get the little fingerprint, you know, and brush it up and, and check it out. Who does it match? Find the little clues. That wasn't what these guys were doing. He said, when you go in to spy out the land, find the highest place. Get up high on a mountain. Do you remember the song I sang the other night? It was called From Heaven's Point of View. Get up high on a mountain top, and I want you to survey the land below you. Look at the camps, where they're located. Map them out. Look at the troops, where they're located. Look at where the vineyards are. Look at the foliage. Get up high and take a good look at it. Now I want you to go down. I want you to see if they're friendly people or they're not. And if they're not, run like the dickens and get back here. No, I didn't say anything. He said, bring home some grapes for dinner. That's actually what he said. It's harvest season. Go get some grapes. Bring some grapes home. Bring some of the food. Eye out the land. All 12 of you. So Moses sends them out. Mind you, he picked the smart guys. And... Um, you know, you have people in the church today that you can ask them to do something and say, oh, we're able to do that. I want you to pray for this. Oh, I'm able to do that. We have so-and-so and they're sick. Uh, I don't know. Maybe God doesn't heal that disease. Could you, like, ask Tina instead? Because I'm not familiar on how to pray with that one. <laughs> I always love those things. But here they are, so they go high on a mountain and overlook and see giants below. Now, I did a little study on the giants. The giants can be anywhere from 14, 16 to 30 feet tall. Now, the big giants, as it says in numbers, are from the tribe of the... Amalek, Amalek tribe. It, it meant they have long necks. Well, I have a long neck. No, I mean a long neck. Mm -hmm. I have no idea, but you, it could be four to five feet neck. I don't know. But these guys were not little. And they dwelt in the land. Now, Remember I told you how giants got in the land. Fallen angels mm -hmm. came down, which are, were men, angels, male angels, had sex with females. Yep. Humans. And it bred giants through the land. Mm -hmm. Ungodly people. People of sin, immorality. And they filled the land. And here they are. I'm up on the mountain. Oh, hey. Caleb, you see that down there? Hey, Levi. Holy smokes, that guy is massive. Have you ever seen anybody like him? Me neither. I bet she's 25 feet tall. How do you think we're going to fight him and clean the land up? That's a big dude. in trouble here. And you have 
Two spies. Joshua and Caleb. Yeah, they don't look that hard. We whip the snot off them. Yeah, we can do anything with God. Yeah, we know who's in back of us. It's a good thing, Yahweh, you're standing right in back of us. We're not afraid. Moses said we could take the land. We saw what God did when he parted the sea. We can do this. Yeah, not bad at all. Hey, on our way back out, let's go get some of those grapes from the vineyard. And they put it between two people, one pole, one cluster of grapes. It took two people to carry it. Let me tell you a little bit about that. This is not, this is offbeat from the sermon. When things are corrupted, the whole land became corrupted. It changed the whole DNA of the soil. So the soil in that land grew massive, massive fruit and vegetables. So the grapes were this big. See, if you let a little sin in your life, when I say this, you guys are laughing. This big one grape. Two people to carry a cluster of grapes on a pole to two big men. That's how big the grapes were. Why? Because the soil actually contained a change of DNA because of the giants and the sin that was in the land changed the land. Now, I did a little study on that. When the land is cleansed, things become normal. And I know this to be a fact. You let certain things in your life to take root it will change your health. It will change your home. It will change your speech. It will affect you. It's the same way. You let the giants rule the land, and the crops got huge. Well, how did that happen? It wasn't like good fertilizer. You know, it wasn't like Roundup or anything. You know, it got miracle Grow. That's it. We use miracle Grow. No, it wasn't miracle Grow, guys. It was demonic activity in the land that produced an abnormal growth of everything. So here you go. Here's the traits of the ten that came back. When they came back, Moses said, how'd it go? Looked at the first spy and he said, we're in trouble. Second spy said, you gotta be kidding me, Moses. Third one said, not happening. Fourth one said, it's way above our head. Fifth one said, I don't have a response. Sixth one said, I'm really scared. You can't get me to go back there again. <coughs> Seventh one said, I know you told us to spy out the land. I don't want to even move there. I don't want anything to do with that land. All the way up. He looks at Joshua at the end. Joshua, what do you say? Our God is able. Moses goes, Did I hear you say what you said? Our God is able. Well, that's cool. Uh, Caleb, I'm with him. Our God is able. Let's go take the land. The other ten said, we're not doing it. In fact, we're going to go and tell them that the giants are so big, they'll eat us alive when we were like grasshoppers in their sight. And we're going to tell all the people, don't go, because it was so fearful. And fear paralyzed them. For, so for 39 years, not one person went into that land to take it. They all had to die off. And when it came time to pick a leader for the next round, Moses goes, I want one of those guys that said we're able. That's who I want. Because the other ones had doubt, self-depreciation. They said they were like little peons. I'm only this big and the monster's this big under my bed. Fear gripped them, the other ones. 
They had critical spirits. They were filled with rebellion. They had attitudes. You're not taking me back to a land of slavery. I mean, I'd rather go back to slavery than this. They had no gratitude and no thanksgiving. Only unbelief. Whoa. So when I look at a church, I expect every one of you to be able to lay hands on the sick and see them recover. If you do not put into your life sin, and you do not feed yourself fear, and you refuse to feed yourself unbelief and doubt, then God will be able to use you if you're in the Word and in prayer. Because you're feeding yourself good stuff. See, there's nothing better than, than to have you shrink back in fear and live tiny, useless lives. That's what the enemy wants. That's what Satan wants. Just know you will never amount to nothing. Oh, really? Peace, I leave with you. Not as the world gives, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. If you start to expect fear, let's say you had a bad experience one night and you you were fearful in your sleep. Okay? So you woke up and you were afraid. You used the word of God over it and you went back to sleep. But now it's the next night before you go to bed, the enemy will say, <laughs> Remember last night? I gave you a nightmare. I, what I do is I go looking for where it came from. Lord, did I put anything in me that opened a door anywhere for fear to come in my life? I go hunting for it. If I didn't, boy, I go after that. Oh, no, devil. You're not bringing fear on me tonight. I take authority over you in the name of Jesus. I bind you. I break your power and the authority of that power. And every assignment, every curse spoken against me, any trap of the enemy, I break its power. It will be null and void in my life and in my family's life. And I mean, I really go after that. And there are prayers over there. Um, Rhonda had me print them out. In the little blue book, or turquoise book, you can pick one out and go, I want one for free or fear, I want one. Probably the most powerful one that people keep buying, I just or not buying, but taking. Um, I just had another dozen printed today, and I forgot to pick them up, were a prayer against demonic spirits and strongholds. And um, I prayed that a couple times. said, Nick, I think we need to pray this prayer of agreement. And we prayed it. I mean, you just get together with your mama. That's the most powerful prayer you can pray is a prayer of agreement. Carl and Cindy, Janine and Herman, you start praying a prayer of agreement. Betty joins in. Grabs Monisa. Mom, we're going to pray a prayer of agreement over this. Something happens Amen. in that prayer. Amen. See, Satan is very shrewd. He doesn't give up real easily. <laughs> he wants you in bondage to fear. He wants you in bondage to sin. He hopes that he can draw you in and sucker you in like... Do you love those sound effects? Okay. You better live watchfully, ready to recognize it and immediately confront it the minute he does it. Don't you wake up in the morning if you've slept and had something wrong with your sleep and let it go. You wake up mad. And you go after it. When fear grips you on something, you don't entertain it. That's right. Oh, let me see. Let me take it to lunch. <laughs> oh, you know, I should call three people and tell them about it, how That's I'm so sweet. afraid. No, you better run right to the word. Get that medicine and slap it upside the head. Amen. That's right. Something I hate worse than anything is, you know, your great uncle George, he had cancer. Cancer of the eyeball, so 
I saw you blinking the other day, and I thought you might be getting it too. That's just an example, guys, but you've heard that. Oh, you know, so-and-so, you know, they suffer from depression. You're going to have to suffer from it too. Really? Where do you come up with this stuff? First of all, the only thing the devil can use is old photographs and memories from your yearbook. He goes in, he looks, opens your little photograph book, and he pulls out some pictures and goes, oh. That's right. There you oh, I see what you were doing there. Your memory. He goes back to that little photo. Let me get that. Oh, yeah. And the minute you didn't do anything with that memory the first time, first of all, you didn't take authority over it and say, you know what, Flash, I kill you. Don't you love that guy? You know, that little puppet. I kill you. That is what I say to my flesh. Flesh, die. Memory of that moment, that was sin, die. I kill you. You know, carnal mind, I just picked the carnal mind. I'm going, stand up, don't come back. Until I tell you I want to make no big cookies. Then I will pull you out. Until then, park it. <laughs> I'm serious, guys. And you know what happens? I'm serious. The enemy probably goes like this, like, she's such an idiot. <laughs> mm -hmm. But she does have one up on us. If you don't go after it, you don't go after that photo in your mind. Guys struggle even more sometimes than women. Women may struggle with fears. Guys struggle because they're visual with images. They see a woman and they have to pull lust out of them and cast it down. I see a man, I think, hey, ain't nothing attractive to him. <laughs> I ain't got no lust for that guy. Why? Because what moves your heart is your emotions. That guy ain't talked to you, he ain't flirted with you, he ain't told you you're beautiful, you want nothing to do with him. But guys, it doesn't matter. They can look at something and they have to immediately pull the thought and cast on the imagination. It's the same thing with fear. Women raise their children, they're more likely to gravitate toward fear when it comes to their kids or their grandchildren. Guys will be afraid for their job and their employment, whereas women might be afraid easier for health and their family. Single moms fear both. Single moms no, fear both. Yes, all of it. Yeah. So you don't let the enemy even bring one photograph of sin back to your mind that you were redeemed from. You go after it, you pull it down, and you take authority over it in Jesus' name. It all has to do with lordship and authorization. You confess that Jesus is your Lord, right? You acknowledge the authority of God in your life, right? Then the primary question when you face fear, I want you to say this. Do I have authority over this area in my life? I mean, can I go in there and change this circumstance so I'm not afraid? Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Can I go in there and change and, and work with that employer who says, next time you do that, I'm taking you out and I'm firing you. Can I change that? Mm -hmm. If you can't, then you have to release your own authority over to God's authority because you can't fix it. Right. And now you're going to have to trust somebody else behind the desk. This is kind of how it goes. I want you to get a picture of this, and I thought this was the best example. When you're dealing with a fear, I want you to walk up to the door, and it says, authorized personnel only. <laughs> are you authorized to go beyond it? But there are some things I've been able to fix myself. I've been able to get rid of the fear myself.
I could do it. In the flesh, I could do it in the natural. I could call my kid on the phone and say, where are you? Okay? Uh, my stay too late at so-and-so's house. I'm coming around. You better get your little, let me say it this way. You better get your little tushy backside right, up, right home. Oh, I'm coming right now. And drive slow. There's deer on the road. Okay. I could handle that. That little door that swung both ways that said authorized personnel only. I could just reach in there and take that little fear and get rid of it because I dealt with it. The Word of God says, Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving make your requests known to God. So I want you to get a picture of this, these two doors. And right in back of it is God. He goes, um, I'm sorry, you're not allowed back in here. You're not authorized personnel. This is my job. You stay out. You're in the waiting room. I'm dealing with this. You give me trust. Did you put trust in me as your doctor? How many guys ever had a broken bone? Been to the hospital in the ER where you had to trust a physician to deal with it. I'm going to tell you this. There were some times, if you ever had to go to surgery, you saw the little thing that said, authorized personnel only, stay out, moms, grandmas, aunties, uncles, and dads. Close enough. Authorized personnel only. So when you are anxious, or fearful, the Bible says, um, be anxious for nothing. You have been given authority to do one thing. Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer. So you've been given authority to pray and supplication to petition God and thanksgiving and gratitude. So you've been given authority with three things. You can pray about it. You can give thanks about it, and you can make the petition known and your request known to God. To state your request, that's it. You're not authorized to go forward through that door and try fixing it yourself. That's the door to your future. God stands behind there. He goes, he sticks his head out. You go try to push the door open and goes, what do you think you're doing? Did I give you authorization to be back here? Did I? What are you authorized to do? Pray. Give thanks. Supplication. That means make specific requests known to God. That's it. If you're not authorized behind the door, stay out. Pray. Give thanks. Make your petitions and, and requests known to God. And then trust that the man in back of the door has got it. Okay, I guess. So I'm not authorized to go forward into the future and manipulate any circumstances on my own behalf? Not if you don't have clearance to do so. You got clearance? Do you got clearance? Because once I've submitted to remaining in the waiting room and I'm waiting on God and I've petitioned him and I've prayed and I've requested it and I've put my trust in him and his word. I now sit in the waiting room with peace and he stands behind the door and I have to trust that the man behind the doors Yahweh my Lord, Elam, the Creator, Adonai, my God, is going to do this for me. That's how we're going to handle fear. So when you see the media, <laughs> or you see a storm coming, 
Lord, there's a storm coming. Yeah? Fear begins to grip you. Uh, now, there are times fear sounds like an alarm. It says, get out of the way of traffic. Don't stand in the middle of the road. Somebody's beeping their horn. And all of a sudden, you look up and see a car coming. That's an okay kind of fear. It's called, get your tootsie to the side of the road. But God says, fear not, for I have redeemed you. <laughs> I have summoned you and called you by name. And when you pass through the waters... I will be with you. Amen. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. And when you walk through the fire, you will not be burned, and the flames will not set you ablaze. Isaiah 43, 1 and 2. Let me warn you guys. The God, Jehovah, Yahweh, Adonai, Elohim, the Almighty Creator, Behind the door says, you can pray, you can believe me, you can trust me, you can make a supplication and give thanks, but you can't change the circumstance. That's my responsibility. You do the other stuff, I'll take care of the rest. That's what you do with fear. That's what you do with fear. I want you to sing this with me. You are my hiding place. When my son Danik fell, at five weeks old, he fell out of his car seat on the cement at five weeks, so just a brand new baby. He was not buckled in. I forgot to buckle him in. I picked up the car seat and gave it to my daughter, Jasta, who was 13 at the time, and I said, Honey, take the baby to the car. And I popped a little blanket on top of him, and she walked outside and the blanket got snagged on something and fell on the ground and got tangled around her feet and she fell. And the baby fell out of the car seat on his head. And he had two four inch skull fractures. And they said, we're going to take your children. You must have thrown your baby out of a four story window. We took him up to Northern Michigan Hospital, and my physician there uh, came in to tell me, you must have abused him. I said, no, I did not. Um, and so they put me kind of on observation. Didn't have proof. Actually, there was a witness that saw it happen. Thank God for the witness. Amen. Judy Kuyana from our church waited on me at the restaurant that morning. And she said, that baby was in here. That baby was perfect. That baby left here from the parking lot injured. But I can still remember being paralyzed by fear. For I looked at Jasta. And through the big picture window, I see her doing this. And she's got the baby in her arm, and she's rocking as fast as she can, and she's screaming with tears running down her face. Mom, I dropped the baby. And I couldn't breathe. I could not breathe. So we got in the, the van, and I said, Lord, But Yahweh, Elohim, Adonai, I've been in your presence. I don't feed fear. I walk in faith. And immediately the scripture came to me. He will live and not die and declare the works of the Lord. Amen. So I said, Mama, you pray in tongues and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quote the word. And all the way up she held that baby. And he cur has curled in a fetal position, silent. When we reached the hospital ER, and we put him on the table. And he instantly came alive, slapping the nurses, screaming at them. He was upset. And that was good. That's a good sign. 
And they said, so how did this happen? And I told them, they said, oh, well, fat chance, that's what really happened. Then they came in and said a few things, like his head fell off inside and his neck is broke. I'm like, uh-huh. They had, they had nothing small enough to put around his neck, so they went and got sanitary maxi pads for women's menstrual cycles and fashioned a little neck brace. You tell me how many little neck braces can actually stay on a baby that's five weeks old and mad. Are you kidding? He ripped those things right off. Okay. So then they had him on that table. They called in life flight helicopter. I'm going to fly him down to you. They said, you have your choice, the boss or U of M. And I said, U of M? And one nurse came in and stood beside me, a big black guy, Cornell. Mm. And he said, I'm going to tell you this, and I want you to listen to me. You can trust that baby to me as the nurse and the caregivers, your mother, and, the, and you get on the road, you and your husband, and you meet that baby there. I'm telling you, that's what you got to do. Wisest thing we ever did. We got there, they lost the baby. Couldn't find the baby. They didn't know where they put the baby. It was in a part of a, the ER covered up with a blanket in a corner. I walk, we walked in there about 30 minutes after the baby. This is one time, guys. We blew a tire on the way down, going about 80 miles an hour. It should have blown on the way up to the hospital, but it didn't. It blew on the way down. And I looked at that tire, and Nick is kneeling on the pavement, and he can't, and there's a lock on it. There's a lock on the spare in the back of the van, and he can't get the lock off. It's been rusted shut. You may have to take him to his mommy, little one, so I can finish this story. Okay, Marlena? Thank you. So here I am, what do I do? There's a lock on the tire. I'm at a loss. It will not come off, it is rusted shut. The Jesus woes up in me. <laughs> I had it way back then. I didn't know I had it. I said, Jesus' name, and Nick went, and it popped open. And he puts the tire on, and we head down. So now we're 30 minutes behind. And when we arrive, and they can't find the baby, I said, I want my baby. That baby is here. And they're like, you certainly don't look like a woman who just threw her baby out of a four-story window. I said, I most certainly didn't. Where's that baby at? That's my baby. By golly, they found that baby in a different hospital. Oh, okay. And we went over to the, diff the other hospital. We went to Mott's. But that isn't where the baby was supposed to be flying at first. They took him in. They did x-rays. And they said, we can't get a clear x-ray. Everything's fuzzy. Kind of looks like we can't see what's going on. And I went, ch ch hey, Jesus. The whole time he was up there, while I was driving down, my mom and Kathy Bowden stood beside him and quoted the Word of God and read Scripture. They read Scripture to a five-week-old? Oh, you bet. Because that is health and healing to all your flesh. Amen. And he's my flesh. Amen. So then they come over and she said, you can't. You know, we're going to go in for a CAT scan, but you can't go with them. I had already been in there for the x-rays, and I said, what do you mean I can't go with them? Well, you can't go with them. I said, oh, you want to make a bet? 
I'm his mother. I'm going in. She said, I don't understand it. You're just not behaving like one of them. Like one of what? Like some woman who threw her baby out a four-story window. Could be because I did it. But he soothes. I heard her talking to the other, somebody else. He soothes at her voice. Oh, that's not an abusive mom. That's just not. <laughs> Boy, I don't know. They come back and they said, well, we, we're not getting a clear scan. We're going to have to sedate him and put him under. He's moving too much. We're going to put him under and do an MRI. And this time you can't go in. So I sat in the waiting room. And God sent two pastors. They came in. And this is the song that I played the Sunday before at church. And it ran through my heart. And I never stopped singing it for five years. After they said, your baby's fine. His head is on just fine. We already see healing in his brain. We can tell how he fell. We can see there's not a bruise or mark on his body nor an indentation. And we can see that nobody abused him. I still was paralyzed with fear. But whenever fear came, which was like every time the baby crawled and bumped his head, I had fear. Every time he, he walked a step and I wasn't right behind him, I had fear. Anytime somebody carried that baby across the room, I had fear they would drop that baby. And this is what I would sing. And I want you just to sing it tonight. Lord, we will trust in you. We trust you with our lives. We trust you, Father, that you are our God. Adonai, the great I am. The God who flies with us on airplanes to Hawaii. The God that stands in courtrooms and brings all the truth and let it be known. The God that gives you houses and supplies needs and keeps your jobs and makes provision for you. That's the God we serve. And Father, I thank you for who you are. I ask you to line the highway for our coming and going. Yes. I thank you, Father, that there's a hedge of protection around our people, every one of them. None of them will come to harm. No weapon formed against them will prosper. And Father, I thank you all the days of their life are counted and numbered. And they will live a long life and declare the works of the Lord. And with a long life, will you satisfy them and show them your salvation and their families. Father, I thank you every one of their sons and daughters. Every one of their brothers and sisters will know you as their Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for coming.